<laughs> Look at this beautiful, bright, sunny day. I have a few more days left here before I have to head back home. So, <laughs> but don't let this bright, sunny day fool you. Because it's minus 17 out. Okay, let's do some Nabu stuff. If you guys want to play the new version of Game Man, yeah, I have it online. Uh, you can play it before watching the rest of this video. So just go to user area one on the A drive and it's called game five. So there it is there. Yep. So game five. Boom. You can select up to four players, even though there's no score or really anything to do yet. But it's uh, it's a demo and work in progress. Ooh. What's going on, Nabooers? Well, as you can see, Game Man Yeah has some additions and some changes. And uh, what's kind of neat too is you can put it into zero player mode right now and just hit play and use it as a screensaver if you just want to watch the asteroids bouncing around. So I learned a few things um, last night when I was uh, modifying the code for to work on the real hardware because getting it to work on the metal was actually a little bit more difficult than I thought. Um, MAME is pretty forgiving. I mean, you can throw burnt toast at MAME and it'll figure out how to render it. With, uh, with, the, with the metal, things were a little bit difficult. And I, f I was watching uh, John's Basements video today and this morning, and it was kind of neat because he actually ran into a similar problem that I was having, which was, um, about probing the VDP, uh, VDP's interrupt to get the end of a scan so you can start coding before the next scan. And uh, I was probing it rather than having using one of the maskable interrupts on, uh, on, the, on the NABU. Well, <laughs> it, I couldn't see, seem to get it to synchronize. I couldn't figure out why. So what I ended up doing is uh, is using an actual interrupt. So um, I add the interrupt here, and here's my interrupt code. So what I end up doing before I back up the stack and save the stack is I always end up uh, doing a build, and then I take a look at the list file to see... Um, let's see, so it's my VDP. There we go. So we're looking inside of the ISR, and what I'll do is I'll look at all the different registers that are being used and figure out which registers I should be saving, okay? So an example for that would be um, like the keyboard input. So I have in Nabu lib, there's a interrupt for the keyboard, which you'll see here and I back up, I save these registers. I don't save, as you can see in here, IX, right? Because um, it's not being used, but these ones are being used. And if we look at the HCCA RX interrupt, you'll see I'm only saving three of them because only these three registers are being used. And I check that when I compile. So in the ISR for the VDP, all of these registers are being used essentially because there's a lot going on. Now, um, I'm gonna, see, I, I'm calling this function to set the sprite, which is going, you know, so it's leaving the, it's, it's leaving this, um, this function and calling another function. It's not a bad idea to do that because I, I don't, my code base will be smaller, but it'll be quicker if I inline these. And if I inline these, which, which means that they run um, all the code will be duplicated, then it'll be faster, use up more memory. And that's always one of the, <laughs> one of the, uh, the considerations you have to take as a programmer because a lot of people look at code and they think to themselves, well, this looks ugly. I mean, why, he's got, why, did, why isn't this in a loop? Look at this, this can clearly be a for loop. You're right, it could, but it's too slow to be a for loop. It's way faster to do it this way, to inline them. And the reason for that is because the setup for the for loop, obtaining all of the 
um, the values for each variable have to be set up in the for loop. All this all happens in assembler, right behind the scenes. So it's much quicker, but uses more RAM to inline and unwrap a for loop. And we know that these are going to be static. There's always going to be six rocks, right? And there's always going to be no more than uh, four players. And we could see what how many players are current selected, right? So let's go over how the VDP renders um, and how this works with an interrupt. I created a function instead of nabulib where you can assign a VDP ISR. Okay. And that is in the VDP. Here we go, add the ISR, okay? And in here, it will add the interrupt mask for you. It'll enable the interrupt on the VDP, on the TMS99, and it, you will instantly start getting um, interrupts on your interrupt handler that you passed it. That's right in here. When you're done your program, you can remove the ISR, which you're going to need to do, especially if you're going to be switching to, let's say, a text mode for a menu or something. Now, in the loop, I process the players, and then I check the VDP status, which I have set as a volatile variable, okay? Now, volatile for any non-programmers out there, um, the way the C compiler, well, most compilers that have volatile flags, so what that means is, is another process or another interrupt going to occur, which is going to need to read that variable. And the reason for that is, um, let's say we're processing a variable. Um, let's go to something like here. As you can see, we're using YDIR. Let's pretend, for example, there was many reads of values. Okay, so it was reading that many times. If it was reusing that register that had that variable data in it, it would not see the change of the memory that occurred from, a, from another process or from another, from the interrupt. So on Windows or multi-threaded um, environment or Linux, you could change a variable from another process. And the current process will not notice that that variable has changed halfway through its, uh, its all of its different conditions or its function because it's using it in the register. Now, when you set it as volatile, every time you read or use that variable, it will go back to memory to check it. So that's important for a few different variables that we're gonna be using. For example, this is keeping track of the player locations. And we have X and Y, which are set as vol volatile. We also have this variable here called VDP ready. Now this is important because this saves us a lot of time because there's no need to render the ships or the rocks if they haven't moved. So in any of the conditions, for example, this one here is the player, then what we do is we will, if we move it, we keep track of that it needs to be redrawn and then we set the VDP to true. The next thing about collision. So if the status bit for collision is set, then I check the collision. So I only check collision when it's set. That's why if you notice on my video at the beginning here, you can see the rocks and the UFOs, the asteroids and UFOs, are actually making contact with each other because the collision only occurs when a colored component of the sprite is in contact with another com colored component of a sprite. This looks really simple, but let me explain something to you. This documentation is terrible and it's good at the same time. I did a search for status and I went through and I read every single sentence about the status register. And I read about all the different bits that you can read from it. And I looked and saw that, yes, there's a register zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
And then there's a status register, read only. Okay, what is it, eight? Is it zero? What status register is this? What, how do I get to the status register? And I read it and I read it as much as I possibly could. And it, it just keeps saying, read the status register, read it. I could not for the life of me figure out how to read the status register. <laughs> I didn't know where it was because there, there, there's no, no information about how to read it. Like, is it, a, is it a number? Do I write to a memory location? Do I latch to a, a, an address and then I read that address? I could not figure it out. Well, <laughs> it is the control line. Just reading the control line at all. That's all you have to do. In this case, I just call it latch because that's what I latch to, uh, to set the memory address. So I looked everywhere for this. Now, how did I find it? I found it on a Sega Master System um, emulation document where somebody had wrote something similar about the problem that I'm having about how they could not find <laughs> The and how it's buried in the documentation. It's well, not buried. It's hidden entirely. So that was really interesting. And I'm sure if I um, would have watched uh, John John uh, Basement Sprite videos, um, I probably would have seen that because he probably ran into the same problems. Okay. So a couple of the changes that have that have been made um, to the code since you last saw it is I'm setting up random values. Generally, when you when you get a random value seated, it comes from a really complicated operating system and CPU and all these different things. Now, on a computer that you just run the program, it's pretty difficult to get a seed when um, <laughs> your your program is going to be the same every time. There's nothing else going on on the computer that you can check for. You could check for some bits and memory. That's what some people do. Well, it occurred to me after doing some reading that there is a R register. And an R register is just a loop. It just increments since the Z80 is turned on and it overflows and starts again. So I could take that R register and I could throw it in as a random seed and I could seed my random function with it. So that's why I can get some randomness without having to go through and check a bunch of memory. Like I mentioned, that's what a lot of other people have done in the past. Now, uh, that was kind of neat to, to to discover. I also split up the joystick into two components. So there's a joystick up and down function, and then there's a joystick left and right. That way we can actually go on diagonal left and right, um, up, down, diagonal. Also, I want to tell you about the sprite editor that I'm using. Let me just update here first. I'll put the download for the sprite editor in the quiver on anabu.ca. So the sprite editor that I'm using is called um, Sprite SX Dev Tool, and it kind of say it's pretty awesome. So you can load up your your sprites, and you can edit each one and save them as a sprite file. So just click on your generate data, select it as a C file, click get data, copy everything that you get, your program code, paste it in. And I created a nabulib function called load sprite pattern table. So now that you have all the patterns inside of memory, all you need to do is initialize your sprite, give it an ID that you're going to be referring to the sprite as, give it your pattern ID. So let's say this is the second or third sprite inside of my list. That this will be number. This is number one. And then I pass it my x and uh, y coordinates and the color you want to you want it to display as. So it's pretty basic. And then moving a sprite around, um, if we jump into the ISR, we have set sprite position. And if you take a look at the header file on Nabulib, you will also notice a bunch of other sprite commands. So there's information in here about how to add an ISR and then you jump down a little further and then we get into the sprite commands right here. So you can disable a sprite, which will hide it, add the pattern table, initialize a sprite. Again, there's information and manual written for all of it. Set the sprite color, set the sprite position. You can set the sprite position and color. You can get the position of the sprite and that's all you need to do. So a sprite is pretty basic. If a sprite has an ID of zero, 
it'll overlay on top of a sprite that has an ID of say six or seven. When the sprite pattern is loaded, it could be one of two sizes, eight by eight or 16 by 16. If multiplication is turned on, which is a scalar inside of the VDP, then it'll output a 16 by 16 from an eight by eight or a 32 by 32 if it's a 16 by 16. The attribute table is really how you reference a, sp a, a pattern and you put that pattern onto the screen. So an attribute table takes a first byte as the vertical position, the second byte as a horizontal position, the third byte is the name, which is essentially is the pattern ID. So let's say the UFO is, is pattern ID number one, in the, in the pattern table, this will be a number one. Then you have the color here. So the first four bits of the color is the actual color. And then you have, these are unused. And then you have this, something called an early clock bit. Interesting thing about that bit is it shifts the X value by 31. So the reason for that is there's a border around the screen and you can hide sprites behind the border. So because the resolution is 255 uh, pixels, if you set this, this magic bit here, you can take a sprite and it'll offset it by 32 uh, pixels and it'll hide, you can hide it in the corner. And lastly, if you made it this far through my long video, let me tell you something else I learned, which I thought was really interesting. When you initialize the sprite table, you only initialize the sprites you're gonna use. Therefore, every other byte in the sprite table is gonna have a zero name in it, and a zero for both positions, and a zero clock bit, which means it's gonna sit in the upper left visible region with no pattern, or the very first pattern that you provide it. Because if you provide a zero pattern of, as to the, uh, when you load this the sprite data in, then you're gonna have a whole bunch of these zero pattern sprites up in the top corner because the default value of 32 of these is gonna be all zeros. So what I ended up having to do is a disable sprite command. And what disable sprite will do is it'll move the y, the y coordinate to the bottom left of the screen. It'll move the X coordinate to the far left and it'll set that bit so it subtracts this, this by minus 32. So it's down in the corner off to the side. It also sets the sprite um, that's gonna be displayed as a zero. And inside of my sprite list, my first sprite is completely blank. This is because when I went to run the program the first couple times when I was experimenting with the collision, the collision was always on and I couldn't figure it out. Well, it's because all the sprites that were uninitialized had a, an ID of zero they were all off in a top of the screen and they were all colliding with each other, <laughs> okay? So I had to create an empty sprite so that its default value is empty of, of sprite number zero so they don't collide. Then I just hit it off the bottom of the screen because the other thing is a couple people had noticed that when they saw the first demo I had posted, asteroids got to the top up here, they would act as if a sprite had been there even though there was only one asteroid up there. So some people with some good eyes were noticing that. The reason why was because in this top left corner were a whole bunch of the sprites that were not visible. They were just sitting up here doing nothing. So I had to hide those sprites. <laughs> that, was, that was kind of interesting gotcha as well. So there's a few little things that I took care of and learning curves I got for all of you. For who, if you're gonna be using Nabulib, then uh, you, you can thank me for having to go through all these painful uh, learning curves. Okay, I'll see you all in the next video.